Welcome to Remnant Stew, the podcast that is very luminous and proves that the world is strange and crazy. I'm your host, Steve. And I'm Leah. And today we'll be discussing all things that glow. Things that are all aglow. That's kind of a nice thought, isn't it, Leah? That's right. Good things and bad things. Good things and bad things and things all over the world that glow for various reasons. Do you have an appetite for the curious and downright bizarre? Then you've come to the right place, my friend. Pull up a chair and grab a spoon for today's intriguing serving of Remnant Stew. I don't know if you can remember the first time that you ever saw a black light. I can. I was I was 10 years old. It was uh, 1968, and it was at the World's Fair in San Antonio called Hemisphere. And uh, we were in some, I don't even remember what kind of a exhibit it was. It seemed like there were puppets and stuff, but there were black lights. And my mother pointed out that the white parts of my shirt were glowing. And I, I don't remember the show, but I remember the black lights <laughs> glowing on my shirt. And so that was a, a you know something that stuck in my memory for sure about... Um, about that that time that uh, you know it was cool that it was glowing i i don't remember the first time i saw a black light but i remember i mean i lived in a skating rink right and they always had that black light and right. and everything that and then you know and i grew up in the 80s the time of neon and so a glowing decade for that's sure. right well <laughs> i have a story about um one of our kids scaring us to death when uh, when my oldest son was, I think he was about three years old, it was right. Halloween, and we had done all things Halloween. We went trick-or-treating, got all the candy, all of that, and, uh, and so by the time we bathed him and put him to bed, we were exhausted, and we, we went to sleep right. and went immediately to sleep, and I guess it was about 30 to 45 minutes later. I woke up out of a, and, and you got to understand, my bedroom is completely black. It's completely dark, as dark as possible. And I woke up because I heard a noise. Right. And so I was looking around, and I that's when I saw it. It mm-hmm. was this glowing so, shape, something. <laughs> something hovering around the foot of my bed. And I jumped because it scared me so bad. Right. And that woke up my husband, Paul, and he jumped. And then we sat there and looked at it, trying to figure out what in the world we were seeing. And then it says, Mommy, Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> and it was Drew. He had come in. He had We put him to bed with a glow stick, oh. which he then chewed through like oh. you do. And smeared it all over his head. No. It was the creepiest looking thing. And so it, then I made a mad dash to go through all of the garbage to see if, if the packaging said it was non-toxic. And it was. And there was this glowing trail from his bedroom to ours, <laughs> kind of like a Scooby-Doo cartoon. Right. And his, his bed was glowing. And so we had to rebathe him and and change the sheets. And it took me hours to go back to sleep after that. I guess so. It's, I lost <laughs> years off my life. A glowing saying, Mommy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't, we didn't know if we were seeing a ghost or exactly. what. And it was Halloween and, you know. Anyway, oh, so there's all kinds of luminescent things that glow. And Absolutely. you're going to tell us about some of them, right? Yeah, this comes from an article called The Seven Weirdest Glow-in-the-Dark Creatures. And... Um, I'll just uh, jump into it here. It says, glowing is a common trick in nature. Bioluminescence, the ability to give off light through a simple chemical reaction, is so useful that it can be found at at least 50 different creatures and among such diverse life forms as mushrooms, fireflies, and terrifying deep-sea creatures. Whether to ward off predators, attract prey, rid cells of oxygen, or simply cope with living in the perpetual darkness of the deep ocean, Bioluminescence is one of life's most ingenious tools. And here are some of the coolest and weirdest creatures that possess the ability to glow. Okay, so you ready for this first one? I like this one. This I'm is, ready. This is ready. called the female anglerfish. As in, send the women out to catch fish, right? Female anglerfish. Thousands of feet deep in the North Atlantic, the female anglerfish wields her own fishing lure. 
She trails glowing tentacles that resemble seaweed to attract the attention of hungry fish. I, sh- I sent you the picture of this. You saw that? Right, and, and that? we're, we're going to put it on our social media. That's right. Yes. And she holds erect a barbel, a headlamp of sorts, which lures prey and gives the anglerfish a clear view of where to clamp down on her oversized jaws. The light in the barbel is generated by... A bundle of bioluminescent bacteria, while the glow of a faux seaweed is produced by the anglerfish herself. As seen in the model, a male anglerfish comes along for the ride. Small and decidedly unalluring, he parasitically attaches himself to his mate's berry, uh, belly. Um, this is kind of the undersea version of the good time Charlie among the fish, you know, uh, letting, the, letting the woman do the work and he hangs out for the, for the good time there. I can think of a couple ex-boyfriends like that. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the female anglerfish. Now we have another one. Oh, this has got a great name too. The vampire squid. This frightening squid lives 2,000 to 4,000 feet down uh, below the surface of the tropical and temperate oceans. It can precisely control the duration and the intensity of flashes emitted by its bioluminescent arm tips and waves those flash bulbs to disorient attackers. At other times, the squid hides in, in the dark by pulling its webbed arms over its head so that only the dark side of its cloak is exposed giving him the vampire name. Just like a vampire pulls a cloak over its face. However, this foot-long cephalopod is no bloodsucker. Scientists don't yet know what it eats. I absolutely love octop- well, cephalopods, octopus right. and squid. And, and vampire squid is, is really a beautiful squid. I, I like the fact that it can, it can cover up its light when it just wants to be uh, hidden. And then send out the light and, and the flash bulbs you know I, what it makes me think of is um, uh, one dark morning when I was uh, driving somewhere and there was a police car stop somebody on the side and they had their flashers going well I found it kind of disoriented <laughs> too <laughs> so I can see how that would disorient their prey they would uh, stun them for a moment with all the flashes well how about uh, crystal jellies these purple green rimmed creatures live off the uh, off of the Pacific coast of North America They're called crystal jellies. They dazzle the deep sea with two distinct kinds of glowing. First, they are bioluminescent, producing a purplish blue light through a chemical reaction between calcium and the protein acorium, A-E-Q-U-O-R-I-A-N, acorium. This light, in turn, triggers fluorescence around the jelly's rim. A molecule called green fluorescent protein, GFP, absorbs the purple-blue light and transforms it into green. Since scientists discovered what makes the crystal jelly glow, acorium and GFP have become important tools in research. For example, they can be injected into other creatures and used to visualize processes inside the body. I believe we have a picture of this one also I think on so. our website, I think so. too. Uh, so he has the kind of purplish glow, but then there's a little green trim around him, a green stripe that seems to go around him. And how cool would it be to glow? Like, yes. <laughs> like if I if I had a superpower, that would be cool. Ooh, that would that, that would certainly give you one up on uh, on your prey for sure. But I would want to be able to turn it off too. So kind of like the vampire squid. Now maybe you've seen pictures, uh, Leah, of the certain places around the world where the ocean seems to be glowing a a really bright blue color, almost an uh, unnatural looking blue, like it was almost dyed. Well, um, the the neon color comes from something called dinoflagellates, D-I-N-O-F-L-A-G-E-L-L-A-T-E-S. Those are single cell plankton with tails that slosh around together in vast numbers. These creatures have been highlighting Earth's coastlines for over a billion years, and for the past few millennia, they've puzzled humans who used to attribute the glow uh, to some kind of uh, magic or to the gods. It certainly looks magical when you see pictures of it. We might have a picture of this as well. I've just, seen pictures of it. To swim in that water would be amazing. Right. It seems it seems really strange that the water has such a such an odd blue color and, it, and glowing even at night. Um, dinoflagellates still puzzle us. We know how they glow, but not why. They might have uh, have used bioluminescence in a way of frightening predators, or to reveal those predators' location by flashing when touched. 
Alternatively, their bioluminescent may just be a fancy way of ridding themselves of oxygen radicals because the chemical reaction requires oxygen. Whatever the answer, they certainly are spectacular. Be really beautiful pictures when you see the dinoflagellates um, lighting up a coastline. Yeah, a lot of yeah, you can see the they kind of rim the waves because because they only glow when they're um, when they're when you agitate them. Right, I guess. when they're stirred up. Yeah, right, when they're stirred up, and so when the the I've never seen them in person, but I've heard that it's beautiful when the waves come in or just swimming in that water, and and as you swim, you agitate them, and they and right. they glow. Yeah, or as it's coming in and back, the waves are coming back and forth, kind of stirs them up too. Really fascinating. Well, now let, our next one is called the Stoplight Loose Jaw Fish. I love that name. <laughs> the Stoplight Loose Jaw Fish is named for the two-step process it uses to catch its dinner. First, the fish uses bioluminescence to trigger red fluorescence in its nose and emits a pulse of red light in order to spot red shrimp. When said shrimp is found, it chows down on this sizable prey by unlocking its loose jaw. Kind of like a gigantic garbage truck with a, <laughs> with, a, with a dumpster slinger. The shrimp, like almost all other deep sea creatures, can't see red, so they rarely see this ingenious predator coming. Oh, wow. Now, this next one is really cool. You found this one. This is neat. Oh, yes. The it, yeah, how do you say that? Go ahead. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it a try. Cystolaspis shrimp. <laughs> Uh, and then in parentheses, glowing loogie. Well, that doesn't get your attention. I don't know what. Well, uh, though deep sea shrimp uh, came off as a pretty pathetic in the last article. You know, they can't see red, for one thing. Uh, some actually have a nifty defense against predators like the lo stoplight loose jawfish. Shrimp of the species Cystolaspis pellicuta startle <laughs> predators by spitting out bioluminescent fluid. Their glowing loogies disorient the enemy giving the shrimp time to hightail it. So, you know, you, you're being, you're being uh, tailed by, um, by a, a predator, and so how, how do you get away? S spit out a glowing loogie and then run the other direction. Okay, so I take it back. I don't want to glow. I just want to have glowing loogies. I just want to have <laughs> glowing spit that I can, <laughs> that I can spit on people. Uh, and I think we have a picture of this as well. Right. I think so. Now, finally, fluorescent coral. Coral is a type of animal related to jellyfish. Like jellyfish, many forms of coral either glow on their own or when exposed to ultraviolet light. Green is the most common glow in the dark color, but red, orange, and other colors are also known to occur. So there you have it, some undersea creatures that glow for various reasons. So it, it's really cool that, okay, so a lot of them are bioluminescent, but there's a lot of them that glow under black light which right. is interesting because there's not black light and, and you, i wonder if some of the fish and some of the creatures can see that without the yeah. black light having it's, to be available it's interesting the the thing about the, the some underwater creatures can't see the color red and so you, there could be a lot to do with um, the, the way that they do see and spot each other a lot that we don't know about those undersea creatures okay so let's talk about glowing people uh, yes, I love some glowing people myself. <laughs> so uh, we're going to talk about the Radium Girls. This is this is kind of a sad story. Is uh, this like the Spice Girls? <laughs> I don't I don't know how sad you consider the Spice Girls, but <laughs> you know. But the Radium Girls, uh, in the height of the Industrial Revolution, in the U.S. Radium Corporation in Orange, New Jersey. This was 1918. Uh -huh. uh, the corporation's success story began with the new technological demands of the Great War. Soldiers huddled up in the muddy trench trenches of Europe learned quickly that the pocket watches they carried were totally unsuited to the battlefields. They were easily crushed, and they were hopelessly unreadable at night. So luckily, German scientists have de had developed a self-luminous paint some years before the war. This paint glowed due to a rather neat little cascade of chemical interactions. If radium salts were mixed with a zinc compound, particles emitted by the radium caused the zinc atoms to vibrate, and the vibration caused a buzz of energy visible as a faint shiver of light. Oh. 
So radium this, paint. Okay. That's right, radium paint. This pale, pale greenish glow was easily outshone by daylight, but in the dark, it was just luminescent enough to make an instrument readable without making it easily detectable by a watching enemy. Oh, uh, not like the three on a match. So you would want to do that. They want it really bright, but just barely bright enough to be able to read. That's okay, right. That makes sense. So after American troops joined the war in Europe, the factory in Orange, New Jersey, won a contract to supply radium dial instruments to the military. By the time the war in it ended, wristwatches with their glowing dials and handy wristbands were all the style. So nice. were luminous-faced clocks nicely dressed up in gold and ebony for elegant homes. At the factory, the dial painters were taught to shape the brushes to a fine point with their lips. And you got to understand Ooh. that in the factory, it was yeah. women at this time yeah, because the were men were, exactly. were at war. And so they used, the, they used their mouths to shape the brushes to a fine point producing the sharp tip needed to paint the tiny numbers and lines of the watch dials, the lacy designs of fa fashionable now clocks. you need a very tiny tip. So, okay, I can see you taking a little brush and, you know, right in your mouth. Okay, got a, got a nice fine point now, right? That's right. Very, very uh, sanitary. Uh, <laughs> the painters were teenage girls and young women who became friendly during the hours together and entertained themselves during uh, breaks by playing with the paint. Well, why not? You know? uh, right. I mean, it was really cool. You got to admit, yeah. it was cool, and uh, and they had no idea at that time that it was at all dangerous. They sprinkled the luminous liquid in their hair to make their curls twinkle in the dark. <laughs> they brightened their fingernails with it. Yeah, and I one, can see that. Yeah. One sure. girl covered their, her teeth to give herself a Cheshire cat smile <laughs> when she went home at night. I wonder if she was trying to scare somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, none of them considered this risky behavior, and why would they when the doctors were using the same material to cure people? Oh, okay. That is, until one by one, the dial painters began mysteriously to fall ill. Mm. Their teeth fell out, Ouch. their mouths filled with sores, their jaws rotted, and they wasted away, weakened by an apparently unstoppable anemia. By 1924, nine of the dial painters were dead. Mm -hmm. They were all young women in their 20s, formerly healthy, and with little in common except for those hours that they spent sitting at their iron and wood desks in the factory painting tiny, bright numbers on delicate instruments. Mm. Well into the 1920s, the dangers of radium were not known to the public, although some executive and scientists in the industry were increasingly aware and protected themselves in the factories where the women worked. Mm. Especially deadly to the dial painters, they were instructed to point or lick uh -huh. the paint paintbrush tips while painting the numbers on the dials. But they were not warned about the dangers and did not protect and suspect problems until they begin to suffer severe symptoms, including anemia, radium jaw, which is deterioration. Radium of the, jaw, yeah. I've yeah, deterioration yeah. of their jaw bones mm -hmm. and deadly cancerous tumors. Yeah, the tumors. teeth fall out and the jaw starts to deteriorate, right? So the Industrial Revolution brought about a lot of unsafe practices. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Um, that reminds me of, a, of another story. Um, a few years before that, well, I guess a few decades before that, back uh, back in England. And uh, with the radium jaw, well, in England they called it fossy jaw um, because it had to do with uh, phosphorus. And uh, it, was, um, it was discovered in a similar kind of a situation where young women were working in a factory that made matches. Um, right, The right. article comes to us that says... Um, uh, it's about Fossey Jaw. It says bone is remodeled. I'm sorry, yeah, remolded or, no, it says remodeled. Let me start again. <laughs> bone is remodeled or renewed throughout life by cells called osteoblasts and osteoclasts. Osteoblasts secrete new bone tissue while osteoclasts break down old bone tissue and reabsorb it. When 19th century matchstick factory workers inhaled white phosphorus vapors, the phosphorus circulated throughout the body and combined with other chemicals to produce bios, <laughs> biphosphonates. The bisphosphonates poisoned the osteoclasts, which greatly reduced or eliminated the remodeling of old bone because the alluvial bone around the teeth and in the jaws turns over more rapidly than in other parts of the body. This region is more sensitive to biphosphonate toxicity. The beginning symptoms of osteo, osteonecrosis of the jaw included toothaches, swollen gums, loose teeth, and abscess around the infection. Teeth fall out, 
the bone under the non-healing gum tissue becomes exposed and the affected bones glow in the dark. Not a very nice way to glow in the dark, unfortunately. No, not at all. Eventually, the decaying tissue rots away, causing a foul odor. Amputation of the jaw used to be the only treatment. The disease became known as fossy jaw, osteonecrosis of the jaw. So when you're around the, the white phosphorus and you're inhaling it, it gets into your bones. It causes your bones and teeth to deteriorate. And in the process, you glow. But not a nice glow. How oh how horrible is that? I think it's pretty bad. So so going back to the radium girls, let me just say this: that five. Uh, okay, so all of this happened because of the the industrial revolution, and the mm -hmm. the women were working in conditions. A lot of the times that the their employers knew were dangerous, but right. didn't let on. So the five of those girls, the the radium girls. Um, took the U.S. Radium Corporation to court and sued them in 1927, but their case was hampered by a two-year statute of limitations. So after the women testified in January and April 1928, the U.S. Radium Corporation was granted an adjournment into September. The delay provoked a backlash of newspaper criticism, and, and it really did. Uh, I think the media in that case really helped the, right. the girls uh, with their case. Um, so on June 4th, 1928, the New Jersey women accepted an out-of-court settlement. Many appeals, though, were filed by the Radium Dial Company, outlasting even some of the girls who were sick and dying the while shame, the court it? cases played out. But the cases had a positive effect. They're remembered as being significant in the development of occupational safety and health standards. Amazing. So, so it did something good. It made made right. th those girls made some kind of uh, well, and with good the match change. girls in in England a few a uh, few decades before that, also in the industrial revolution, a lot of these girls were newly off the farm, uh, moving to the city, trying to you know find a way, and that was the job that they found, and there were no workers' rights uh, at all. But as they were realized what was happening, they organized themselves into a large strike. And the newspapers also, at the time, got a hold of it and figured out what was going on and exposed some of the work practices that these girls were uh, were subject to. And so, again, l labor laws were changed there as well. So as a result of these glowing incidents that were not good, there were some good changes that came about. That's funny. This isn't even in our notes, but one of my favorite poems comes from that time. It's written by... Oppenheim was his last name, and it became the rallying cry of a lot of these women as right. they as they uh, stood in picket lines for better treatment. And the the poem is called "Bread and Roses." Bread and Roses. Yes, we fight for bread, but we fight for roses too. So. Nice, very good. Okay, so we're we're going to end with a good story. Or, or a more positive story, let's say that. But it goes back to the Civil War. United which, States Civil War. Right. right. And you were a history teacher. Right. For how long? 40 years. 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> and so you know about how bloody the Civil War was. Uh, the Civil War is was the, as, as deadly as all other American wars combined. Um, over 600,000 Americans uh, died in the Civil War. And that equals the total of all the dead from the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the Mexican-American War, the Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, the Gulf War, and the Iraqi-Afghanistan War. That is, that's crazy. So the one that's war, four years, killed more Americans than... Uh, or as many Americans as all those other wars combined. And, and again, that's American casualties. American there casualties, were, yes. Right, there were a lot more casualties worldwide. But Now, on the topic of glowing, there was an interesting uh, occurrence that happened at the Battle of Shiloh. Right. Uh, Shiloh was a, a location in southwestern Tennessee. My wife and I stopped by there a few years ago on our way back home from, uh, from Nashville. And, uh, it, boy, it's a beautiful place. It's just a gorgeous, gorgeous battlefield uh, setting. Uh, the trees are huge, and uh, there's the, the cemeteries are, are very uh, respectfully uh, manicured. 
and uh, it's right along the banks of the Tennessee River. In fact, the Tennessee River is how the Union reinforced their troops in that battle. And so um, we had quite a, 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 a quite a good time of walking through that uh, battlefield. I highly recommend that people go there. It's not really on the way to anywhere. You really have to go there to, to be going there. But it's really worth the time and effort. Um, well, according to battlefields.org, the Battle of Shiloh, Shiloh was a horrific struggle fought in the tangle, uh, tangled woods and small farm fields of southwestern Tennessee on April 6th and 7th, 1962. 1860. 1862. <laughs> 1862. 1862. It pitted, uh, pitted uh, Confederate generals Albert, Albert Sidney Johnson and PGT Beauregard against Union's General Ulysses S. Grant. By sunset on April 7th, 23,746 Union and Confederate casualties lay across the peaceful landscape, making it the bloodiest American battle to that date. The Battle of Shiloh changed the perception of how costly the Civil War would be and gave birth to the notion that Ulysses S. Grant was a butcher. He would, uh, he would do whatever it took to, to uh, uh, get the job done. That night, as many soldiers lay wounded and dying in the muck and the mud, they noticed a strange and eerie glow to the wounds of some of the men. The glow was greenish-blue in color and a very alarming sight, but as field medics arrived and started taking care of the wounded, it was soon realized that the men whose wounds had the odd glow seemed to have a better chance of healing and surviving. They also had a lower rate of infection. This mysterious healing caused the soldiers to dub the phenomenon angel glow, as it seemed like a gift straight from heaven. And so the legend of the angel glow was born and persisted for 139 years until the mystery was finally solved. I love how, I love lore and legend and how it has roots in, in just trying to make sense of something that, that you don't understand. And so in, here at Remnant Stew, we celebrate curiosity. Right. And that mystery was solved by a very curious guy, um, 17-year-old Civil War buff Bill Martin. He visited the Shiloh battlefield with his family and heard about the legend of Angel Glow. Well, his mom, Phyllis, happened to be a microbiologist who studied a soil bacterium called photorhabdus. I think that's it, yeah. luminescence, or P, luminescence, which is easier to say, which is bioluminescent, giving off its own light. In fact, it gave off a glow that happened to be pale blue-green in mm -hmm. color. So Bill and his uh, high school friend, Jonathan Curtis, wondered if this organism could possibly be the source of angel glow. Well, Bill's mom encouraged them to find out. The, bo the boys learned that P. luminescence lived inside nematodes. Those are tiny parasitic nice. worms that burrow into insect larvae, isn't that nice, in the soil or on plants. And once rooted in the larvae, the nematodes vomit up bacteria which release chemicals that kill the host larvae and any other microorganisms living inside of them. All right. So Bill and Jonathan were slightly stumped to find out that P. luminescence can't survive in normal human body temperature, but it was April in right. Tennessee, and they That's figured cool. out that sitting on the cold, wet ground for two days had lowered the wounded soldier's body temperatures. So when the nematodes from the muddy soil got into the wounds, the bacteria had the right environment to thrive because the men were hypothermic right. and to save the men's lives by cleaning out other more dangerous germs. That's really fascinating, wasn't it? Yeah, and kudos to Bill and Jonathan for figuring that out. Great high school kids. So see there, high school kids, get out there and figure stuff out. And we'll be reading about you someday. <laughs> and I, I want to say, and don't quote me on this, I want to say that they did that as a uh, science fair project. I could be wrong. And, and yeah, probably so, but it sounds like it would be that. Yeah. You know, and, and when I had to do science fair projects, that was the guy right next to me, and I was the one doing stupid stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't even remember one of my science fair projects, to be honest with you. Well, we've had some great glowing experiences today haven't we well, there's a few more want to hear just a few more before we wrap this up yeah because we talked about all of the other bioluminescent things that were they those were all under the ocean right but there's more things there's yeah, more things, are some that, things we can that you see. find out uh, not in the ocean 
And, of course, the first thing that comes to people's mind, fireflies. Oh, yeah. Uh, how many of you ever grabbed, grabbed a bottle? I bet everybody has a bottle or a jar and put fireflies in them in the summertime. That's right. All kids have done that, I'll bet. Fireflies glow to attract mates, and they also encourage predators to associate their light with a nasty-tasting meal. Don't eat that. It glows. You know, nobody eats that. It glows, okay? The glow is caused by the chemical reaction between luciferin, a compound produced in the tail of the insect, and oxygen from the air. I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that it reacted to the air. I do know that when I was a kid and we would catch fireflies right. that the boys would pull off the tail mm -hmm. and write on their clothes or on right. their face or whatever. It's very gross. Of course, in Texas, we didn't call them fireflies. We called them lightning, lightning bugs. bugs. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> All right. Another one is called foxfire. Foxfire is a type of bioluminescent exhibited by some fungi. Foxfire most often glows green, but a rare red light occurs in some species. Have you ever seen foxfire? I never have, but um, you know how, like I said, I love lore and how it usually has its... Uh, Origins and something factual right. like Foxfire or whatever. The the Will of the Wisp, I bet, came from that. I think you're right. I mean, it sounds like it would. The European, Celtic, whatever, uh, Will of the Wisp is, they think it it's glowing little fairies that that uh, if you follow it, it leads you astray. It, uh -huh. leads, it, it leads astray wanderers at night or, or travelers at night. And I could see that. If you saw Foxfire and you wanted to see what it was and then you followed the next and the next, right. you'd get take lost. Take you off so. and then you'd be lost. Right. <laughs> well, another one is snails. Did you know that snails can glow? You don't normally think of snails when you think of glowing nature. But the Clusterwink snail, native to Australia, <laughs> I love is, that name. Yeah, Clusterwink, is the exception to the rule. This little invertebrate flashes its shell when it's threatened or there are predators nearby. It's able to pulse bioluminescence from a single spot in its body, illuminating the entire shell, making it look much bigger, I suppose. This light show is limited to the spectrum uh, the snail produces, though. Hitting the shell with a red or blue laser doesn't have the same effect, so it's mm. just got to produce it itself. You can't force it to do by external means, can you? Now, what about mushrooms? Did you know that mushrooms can glow? I did know that. <laughs> I haven't seen any, but I did know that. Now, we don't live on Pandora, the alien world that serves as the setting of James uh, Cameron's movie Avatar. But you can get pretty close by walking through the forests of Malaysia. Mycena silverlucens is... <laughs> <laughs> Silva, S-I-L-V-A-E-L-U-C-E-N-S, silverlucens, is a mushroom that grows on the bark of trees and glows at night thanks to its internal bioluminescence. You can walk through the forest in the dark and see hundreds of these little greenish mushrooms hanging on the trees, uh, tree trunks, and branches oh, there I bet that, in Malaysia. That is beautiful, isn't I it? I bet it's magical. It sounds like it. Well, how about millipedes? Did you know that millipedes uh, can glow? No. Millipedes but... are creepy enough, but can you imagine a glowing millipede? They, uh, that's the last thing we would really want uh, to think about when it comes to things that glow in the dark. Uh, M-O-T-Y-X-I-A, Motixia, is a species of millipede that glows uh, in the dark thanks to bioluminescence whenever it's threatened. You need to be careful with these little glowing insects, though. Its glow is a warning, and if you don't back off, they start to secrete cyanide from their pores. Wow. So, <laughs> so the lesson here... Besides the fact that we really can't pronounce a lot of the stuff in right. this episode, <laughs> the lesson here is don't eat the glowing things. Don't eat glowing things. Yeah, that's just like from you know that's why the lightning bugs glow because it's it's known you should not eat glowing things. But then we have. <laughs> but there are some things that you should eat that are glowing. <laughs> Last on our list, uh, who hasn't done this? What a green lifesavers. Yeah, that's fun, isn't it? Um, I used to love lifesavers when I was a kid, right? All different flavors, but wintergreen, that's a good flavor. Good to uh, give you a nice, fresh, minty breath. All you need to create light, uh, uh, light sometimes is a piece of candy. Wintergreen hard candies like Lifesavers glow briefly when you crush them between your teeth. This is due to a reaction called triboluminescence, which creates light when mechanical pressure, like when your teeth pr uh, crunch down on it, breaks the chemical bonds of a crystal. Quartz does the same thing when broken because of its crystalline structure. 
So if you haven't ever tried this, get you some wintergreen lifesavers. Go into a dark, uh, maybe your bathroom where you have a mirror, and uh, put it in your mouth and give it a good crunch and watch it glow. And and speaking of the bathroom with the medicine cabinet and everything, Band-Aids have a, a similar thing. That's right. When you, when you pull, you know, they have the tab and the you pull it. A, you pull yeah, off. you pull it a... Uh, pull it out or whatever it it does it creates a glow as well and it's due to the same thing what happens is that what did you call it tribal tribal we have such a hard time wait there's so many big <laughs> words in this uh it it's was not called triboluminescence which yeah. uh, the light created from mechanical pressure yes right and so that's the same thing and what it's what's happening is electrons are becoming excited and give off Pro, uh, photons. I was going to say protons, but photons. <laughs> and the photons are what, what glows. So there you have it. And duct tape, I think, does the same thing. There's a lot of adhesive things when you pull it apart in the dark. It gives a, little, a quick glowing action. That's right. right. It does that. So that was a fun look at uh, glowing things. That's right. And so I, okay, and I, I'm telling you, I don't want to glow, but I do want to have glowing loogies. I think right. that would be cool. I think that's a, that's a good <laughs> idea. Last episode, Shark Bait, that trivia challenge uh, had this question. This famous man that lived 100 years ago affectionately nicknamed his children Dash and Dot. Tell me who he was and how he unknowingly affiliated was affiliated with modern tattooing. You mean somebody got that question right? Somebody wow. did. Yes, it was Diane DeBarros. DeBarros. Oh, I know DeBarros. her. She's very smart. <laughs> she told us uh, on our Facebook page, she said that Thomas Edison named his kids dash and dot as in morse code i don't think he named them that but he nicknamed. called them right nicknamed yeah. them that uh, he had a number of inventions but his electric pen resembled a tattoo machine and she's absolutely right patented in 1876 thomas edison's electric pen was designed to perforate papers you wrote with it and so it would then uh, hopefully create a stencil that could be used to make right. a copy of that document papers, so right. right before copy paper before all of that uh, but it was a failure. It was a dismal failure. In fact, Thomas Edison had a lot of failures, uh, and and that's one of the things that that I want to uh, to just stress that if you're going to do anything, you just got to be prepared to fail at it. And he just right. kept on and kept on. Kept until on he, going. He was persistent. That's right. He was very persistent. Right. But uh, it was only a failure at that intended purpose. In 1891, a New York tattoo artist by the name of Samuel F. O'Reilly produced an electric like tattoo, tattoo needle based heavily on Edison's electric pen, thus revolutionizing the tattoo industry. Well, congratulations, Diane DeVeris. <laughs> so uh, the rules, as always, like and follow our Facebook page at Remnant Stew Podcast. Like and share this episode post. Put your tr answer to the trivia challenge question in the comments of that post, and the first person to do that will be the winner mm. of uh, accolades. Uh, Wonderful adoration as well. That's right. So here it goes. In the early to mid-1940s, during the height of World War II, a glowing phenomenon captured the attention of American soldiers. It was observed often enough to garner a certain nickname, nickname among GIs. So 30 years later, a rock and roll band that would turn out to be very famous and prolific, and still around by, uh, at this time, took on this nickname as their band name. So tell me the name of the band and the name of this wartime phenomenon. See, I got this wrong. I thought it was St. Elmo's Fire. But the, no, the no, there's no band called St. Elmo's Fire. That's a song. Oh, okay. That's a song, but not a band. <laughs> no, I think there was a band back when I was in college, but oh. it was probably local. Maybe, <laughs> maybe. All right. That's going to do it for today. Remnant Stew is created by me, Leah Lamp. Dr. Stephen Meeker and I research, write, and host each episode. Audio is produced by Philip Sinkfeld, who makes us sound good. Great job, Phil. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod with voiceover by Morgan Hughes. Before you go, please hit the subscribe button so you won't miss an episode. Maybe take the time to give us a review on iTunes. Share Remnant Stew with your family, friends, hairdresser, parole officer, whoever you may come in contact. Until the next time, remember, please choose to be kind. And, and always, always stay, stay curious. curious.